Hold on a minute, let me pull this chair a little forward. Okay, we're here live at SiliconAngle.com's exclusive coverage of O'Reilly Media's Strata Conference. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract a signal from the noise, as we say, creating spaces for big ideas to grow, uh, talk to thought leaders, executives, CEOs, developers, whoever it takes to extract a signal from the noise. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, joined my co-host Dave Vellante from Wikibon.org, and uh, we have Tim O'Reilly, who uh, is the owner of O'Reilly Media, who's in for a special guest uh, appearance, as usual. Uh, great to have you, CUBE alumni, I've been on many times. Thanks for coming back on and making time out of your busy schedule. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so, uh, Strata's growing up. Yeah. Uh, the business is growing up. Very competitive, uh, a lot of moves made by big players. Um, entrepreneurs are still out there. Uh, and we're seeing the, the bottom-up organic growth accelerating and the top-down kind of coming together and it's in that middle zone where all the action happens and in, in accelerated in innovation. Sure. Um, what's your, what, are you, what are you thinking about these days around that concept of this market and big data? Because it's not about distributions anymore. I mean, although that's a, a top story with, with all the variety of Intel introducing distribution, which is a significant endorsement. Green Plum making some moves, and you got the Hortonworks Cloud Airs and a variety of other players doing that. But there's other aspects to data. Data as code, shadow data, all these topics we're talking about. What are you thinking about these days around this, this industry? Well, for me, the most interesting thing about any technology industry is not the technology itself, it's what can you do with it? And in particular, I'm interested to see people doing things that are uh, smart. You know, so, uh, you know, Jen Polka today, for example, was talking about this uh, money balling criminal justice project in New York and Louisville, where they're trying to figure out using data and predictive analytics, who is safe to let out on bail, or let out without bail. Uh, you know, it turns out that can save millions of dollars for cities. Uh, that's an unexpected application of data science to a problem that most people aren't thinking about. There are problems in healthcare where we're seeing enormous opportunity. There are problems in energy, uh, in energy efficiency. Uh, Data science is potentially transformative. And the, the first wave, I think, of data science has focused a lot on the kind of marketing analytics. That's where a lot of people got all excited. They were, or, or, or certainly before that, there was sort of financial arbitrage. Um, but I think we're starting to find more and more areas uh, where you can do something really interesting with data uh, that's, uh, has really big business impact. I think we're just in the early stages of getting beyond the gee whiz, how big is your data, how complex are your algorithms, and more into, hey, I've figured out an angle, I've figured out a business model, I've figured out a problem that can be solved using this technology. On the social change side, one of the things that's come up here is that uh, we had Roger on yesterday talking about applied big data. It's just a, a, a term, because just to talk about the range of it, not try to get narrowed down on the subject, but there's the art and science side of it, the design side, which you guys are doing a lot of work at O'Reilly on. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you got real you know, high performance computing and you know, real science and everything in between. Uh, government, you mentioned the criminal justice thing. What's, it's kind of a ratchet. One side gets ratcheted up, the other guy catches up. What are you seeing in terms of the areas of data? Is it all floating up at the same time? Is there any one area right now that you see um, accelerating faster than others? Uh, is it the social interaction side? Is it more the healthcare? Is it bio? Well, I, I think clearly the, you know, at least where we come from. Again, let's be very clear that uh, you know, big data has had an impact in the financial industry for you know, decades. Uh, but the consumer internet has you know, shown many, many new opportunities. I and mean, Google is really the preeminent big data company in the consumer internet. Uh, you know, companies like Facebook and Twitter and everybody else uh, on down are learning uh, lessons from what can you do when you have more data, when you apply it more smartly. Um, so I, I, I think we're still you know, early in understanding that transformation. You know, when I look at, um, you know, just a, a, a simple example, um, you know, YouTube uh, has become, you know, this huge resource for uh, music. 
And I, I heard anecdotally a major pop star uh, who had, is making more money on YouTube than on iTunes, and more than half of that money comes from fan uploaded videos that use this person's music as the soundtrack. Now, how does Google detect that you know, in real time when somebody's playing? Well, guess what, it's big data. You know, so here's kind of an interesting thing. We're looking at uh, you know, the old business model, which is I'm going to sell you this track, but advertising on music got turned into a real business model through the application of big data. Guess what? And I, there, there are all kinds of hidden big data stories. You know, uh, one I'm very fond of talking about, and I've probably talked about it when we talked last year. You know, autonomous vehicles. That's a big data story. Uh, you know, GE has been pushing the idea of the industrial internet. What is that? It's a big data story. You know, how to use data to actually do predictive analytics on on machines. Uh, how do you get da sensor data out of those machines and do smart things with it? Uh, so, uh, as I said, I think we're looking at many, many areas, and it's very hard to predict what are going to be, you know, what's the next big thing. And I, there's not a good correlation, between, in my opinion, between Me Too, uh, between sort of venture backed startups in an area, for example, and, uh, you know, the real innovation. Because a lot of those are, are me too, and they're in areas that are already, you know, well trodden. And it's going to be the company that comes completely out of left field and does something surprising and new with data that we're going to go, whoa, and then there'll be, you know, of course, that all the people follow. And then everybody will jump in. So That's I wanted right. to ask you about that. So you made, made reference Moneyball earlier, and you see Moneyball, and the Oakland A's had their advantage, and now everybody's using Moneyball, and a lot of people yeah, yeah. said, oh, big data's going to go the same way. Everybody's going to jump. He's like you said, oh, yeah, yeah. VCs. It just seems like the opportunities are so vast though that it's not uncommon for things to get commoditized and then yeah. you go on to the next area of opportunity. Is that the way you see it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, no technological advantage lasts forever. Forever, right? <laughs> uh, and Nick Carr will eventually be right. Right, and then, <laughs> well, and... <laughs> We've been banging on Nick Carr for three years now. He'll never so forget easy. that line. Yeah, we love Nick, though. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the really smart companies will bring together a bunch of competencies. You know, yeah. my, you know one of my favorite companies right now uh, is Square. You know, I, I think what, what Jack is doing is so smart uh, in, in a, a lot of pathfinding ways. You know, back when he first pitched Square, I remember hearing, you know, he was thinking of it as a data company. You know, we're going to be able to do predictive modeling using social graphs about who's good to extend credit to and so on and so forth. So there's that whole data back end. They're a maker company. They started with this little device that would allow them to, you know, anybody to take a credit card. But then they branched into this thing that I think is really one of the most interesting things uh, around, which is that they figured out how to build what Dave Stutz once called software above the level of a single device. When you walk into a square cash register enabled store, you know, and you have the Square app on your phone, your face shows up on the cash register. You know, so you walk and your credit card's already registered, you walk up and they say, you know, they ask your name and you say your name and they've got two factor authentication. You know, you've told them your name and there's your face. And uh, you know, they've got your credentials already, they just you walk out with your goods. They completely rethought the workflow of the store. And I think Square is going to, you know, and what they represent is going to be huge. There's real lessons there for any startup. You know, what can you subtract once you have enough data, when you have sensors to provide context? And then how can you make that interaction more effective and, and beautiful? And I, I think we're going to see a lot of opportunities to reinvent whole industries. Uber is another example like that. It's really, they built a system you know, between your smartphone, uh, the, uh, you know, the driver's smartphone, and a cloud app that is tracking where the drivers are in real time, and can, you know, connecting you. I mean, beautiful. And, and I think, as I said, we're just in the beginning. You know, now you start imagining some of the same things with you know, drone delivery of of goods, you know, on the fly to you where you are. Yeah, there's all kinds of crazy ass things that you can come up with there. So uh, let's talk about that disruption because what you're highlighting is essentially entrepreneurs out there who see something that they want to do and maybe take like in Square's case they're doing a little data and it evolves or on a path or on a vector, if you will, of innovation. But to disrupt an existing incumbent structural market is hard, right? It's really difficult to do. So, you know, we've been having conversations here um, with the, the attendees and the uh, executives here and entrepreneurs 
in IT and in data governance, and you have a lot of structural barriers involved in data. You know, do I store it? How do I govern it? And the innovation could be choked. So we're, we're, we're trying to understand what is the path for disruption of data? Uh, obviously, it's free data, is it shadow data? Because shadow IT was a, a no-no, now it's emerging as, hey, that's where innovation was in the enterprise. Yeah. So data seems to be going down that same road where there's a lot of things in the way, hurdles. Um, yeah, I guess I would say, first of all, nothing uh, that's worth doing is easy. <laughs> <laughs> or very few yeah. things that are worth doing yeah. are easy. And, uh, you know, it's going to be no different to, you know, crack some of these problems, and there's going to be big pushback. You know, think about music. You know, Napster got shut down. Uh, you know, but today we're streaming m music and movies, and we're you know we're in a very different world than the one that Napster entered. And I think the same thing is going to be true of people who go up against some existing uh, business model incumbent. Some of them will get shot down, and eventually some of them will break through and change the world. I I don't have specific opinions about. You know what are the issues? Uh, certainly, privacy, big big issue, and we'll probably, you know, I, I you know, I've said this before, uh, you know, uh, with talking with you guys, I think our attitudes towards privacy need to change. Uh, you know, from the sort of we're going to protect, you know, we're going to keep all your information secret to we're going to figure out what are the social norms about what you can do with the data if you do happen to get it. Um, I, I think that we're going to, you know, which is not to say that you won't be able to have privacy, but you won't have privacy by saying, we're going to punish you if you actually collect this data, we're going to punish you if you do bad things with it. <laughs> yeah. oh, but there's yeah. a value exchange, is yeah, the yeah, point you yeah. made and before. if there's a good value exchange, yeah. then, you know, maybe okay. But, but we're going to end up with, with probably a bunch of things that get shot down that 10 years from now will go, whoa, boy, that company had it right, and they just were, they got all the arrows, and you know, somebody else came along. And <laughs> A couple Big hours ago, two, actually two hours ago on Twitter, you wrote, expect black hat data scientists soon. Yeah. So you retweet or you're quoting yeah. uh, 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 Joe Turian. So yeah. um, what did you mean by that? Were you oh, that was a quote from him. Uh, and I think his, his, his point was that right now, there's a lot of what he called gray hat data science companies. You know, companies that are doing data mining and uh, uh, you know, potentially using it in ways that you know, users would think we're a little squirrely. I won't mention any names, but I think most of us know who those people are. You know, uh, marketers who are you know yeah. somewhat abusive. I would actually say I'd go a little further. I think there are black hat data scientists right now working. You know, the financial crisis of 2007 was the work of black hat data scientists. You know, building you know, uh, uh, you know financial instruments that were doomed to fail. That they knew were doomed to fail, uh, but milked great profits in the meantime. Uh, but I think there's going to be a lot more of that. I think well, what Joe was talking about specifically uh, was, uh, you know, people who, who would would use data science to more effectively spam, uh, you know, advertising networks, for example, by simulating humans more effectively, uh, so on. Or even more malicious. I mean, Stuxnet yeah. kind of opened the yeah, Pandora's sure. box. On we were thinking we were talking earlier about this concept called uh, we talked as, as infrastructure as code, which is a DevOps concept. Now it's emerging around automation using yeah. software. And we kind of uh, threw a term out this morning on theCUBE called data as code, where a lot of developers want to not interrogate the data so much, but you know, learn from the data, make data part of, of, an, of, a, of a learning environment, whether it's apps growing, mm -hmm. no one single data mark can, yeah, can yeah. be there. So you have this kind of, I don't want to say, maybe democratization of data, I don't know what to call it yet, yeah, but, yeah. but there's a developer focus yeah. that's clear, and you got open source is clearly winning, um, you have people trying to put extensions on it, Cloudera and Greenplum and others. So again, we're in this coding environment where developers are, will you be using more data? Um, what's your view on that market as it's developing? Because cloud's great, we all know that, but now with, with data, the well, opportunity to develop with it becomes a focus. I think what I would sort of say about uh, sort of software development in the age of data, the idea that uh, and you know, the fact is that the, the revolution, the data revolution means that the more of the value is in the data than in the software. You know, just like, it, well, you know, again, this is central to my thinking from way, way back. The, the essence of the, um, you know, the PC revolution was that hardware became cheap and commoditized and software became valuable and artificially scarce. 
uh, in the, you know, and when I first sort of formulated my ideas about Web 2.0, they were coming from the notion that software was being commoditized by open source and by the open standards of the internet, and that something else was going to become valuable, and that that thing was going to become who was going to be data. And the, the issue is, there are, is an ecosystem of players who are building tools for data, and you know, it's not to say that they won't be meaningful companies. Uh, some of them may become, you know, really meaningful companies, but I think they'll be more like uh, the Borlands of the PC era than the, uh, you know, or they'll be, you know, again, I mean, even look at the PC, there were, there were great companies like Dell that kind of made a business out of hardware, um, you know, even as hardware was becoming commoditized. Uh, you know, but the, you know, Microsoft was the really great company, yeah. and I think there's a few really great companies who've colonized vast areas of the data universe. And of course, the data universe is bigger than the software universe. Uh, you know, so I do think there'll be similar. You know, like we, we look at Google and Facebook and so on. But there's going to be similar yeah, vertical so, companies. So on the day, on that point, let's drill on that because yeah. um, uh, Greg Sands from uh, just spun out a new VC from uh, Costanova VC, and he put a post up today called "Applied Big Data," which we've been using that term. But yeah. he, he points out in his post that um, users shouldn't have to be entering data, and that the idea of doing data entry into systems to get some value out of it is going to be going away. And we saw, like I say, Google with search, users uh, were aided with fast results, they didn't have to do much, they type a query and they get results. So this notion of user experience around doing less with the data and getting more value out of it yeah. kind of creates this automation or applied kind uh, of concept. I, I totally agree. Uh, I think that the whole notion of how do we change the user experience when we have more data is fundamental. Uh, you know, it'll completely change the design of applications, the design of devices, when we realize how much more we can take for granted. So let's talk about I, the... I, I need to wrap shortly. Oh, okay, yeah. great. So, what do you yeah. think, quickly uh, comment on the social networks? LinkedIn's hoarding their data, they're here presenting. They have OAuth, Twitter has their data, they, and Google Plus has their data. Do you see the social networks evolving to a, a point where the, the interoperability of the data will be user controlled? No. Uh, I guess <laughs> what, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's, it's valuable. You know, what I see happening there is the same thing that happened uh, in the PC era. You know, again, if you look at it, the, the uh, Free Software Foundation grew up at about the same time as the proprietary software industry. Uh, and ironically, their biggest impact didn't come till software didn't entirely matter anymore, you know? Uh, I, I do think there will be a, a data liberation movement that has already started in many, you know, many ways, but it's going to come to flower in 10 or 15 years by the time we figured out some other locus of value. <laughs> okay. you know, in the meantime, you know, I do think we'll see some version of the replay uh, that we saw in the PC era, uh, which is one or another company is going to consolidate their hold and become the de facto standard you know, for social data. And uh, you know, it could be by acquisition, it could be by, uh, but there's a variety of ways that that could happen. Okay. No, you got to go, just on a, on a parting question, just tell the folks out there what, what uh, to expect around Strata right now and, and what's the critical uh, positioning of what's going on with big data right now from your perspective? Well, I think probably the, the most important thing is not to equate uh, Strata with just big data. Uh, I, I think that I've always thought of Strata as a data science event, which means how do we actually you know, get useful meaning out of data. And that can be data of any size. Uh, certainly big data is a, a, a real serious component. But think about uh, you know, meaning and how we use software to extract meaning from data that's contributed by users in the course of computing that's becoming more and more pervasive. Okay, that's Tim O'Reilly, the founder of O'Reilly Media here at Strata Conference, uh, which is exploring data science, tools to trade, all kinds of innovation from business down to the tech. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We'll go out to the events and start to see from the noise. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. We looked at all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. There are plenty of tech shows that provide new gadgets and talk about the latest in gaming, but those shows are just the tip of the iceberg and we're here for the deep dive.
There's a difference between technology consumers and those who live the business day to day, and our viewers recognize that. The market begged for our program to fill that void. We're not just touting off headlines. Our goal is to provide you with a story, but we also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that no one else is asking. Our guests aren't just here to provide commentary. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. The tech business isn't new, but many networks treat it as if it is and really barely scratch the surface on technology coverage. We follow the expansion of the cloud and the evolution of big data. We're covering new enterprise from startup to IPO and every move in between. So what do you think was the source of this misinformation? And so you mentioned briefly uh, there are several other... If that's the case, then why does the world need another software as a service player? I like to think of us as a companion to the cube. We're here every morning trying to extract the signal from the noise. Where the cube excels in event coverage, we're working to bring that experience to you consistently every morning. We use the top stories of the day to provide you with breaking analysis so that you can forecast future trends. Uh, we're here before you even wake up. We're creating a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. Good morning, I'm Kristen Folletti and welcome to News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV for Wednesday, February 27th, 2013. Kim.com and Apple have two very different approaches when it comes to email. Here to discuss the latest trends in cloud services is SiliconANGLE contributing editor John Casaretto. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. We've discussed .com and his mega service on the show before, and with its launch in January, Kim.com's mega has been open to the public for a while now. The cloud storage site offers more than a place to host your files, but also gives each user a personal email account. .com has recently announced plans to incorporate end-to-end -end encryption for the email service, specifically saying, we're going to extend this to secure email, which is fully encrypted, so that you won't have to worry that a government or internet service provider will be looking at your email. John, why do you think .com wants to offer this encrypted email service to users? Well, I think that there's a number of others, uh, a number of people that worry about a government or a company or internet service provider that, that's going to be looking at your mail. So for those that are concerned about privacy, .com sees this as an opportunity to, to provide a service that, uh, that people want. Uh, you know, we know about the recent Google uh, situation where they provided countless emails over to the government without so much as even a warrant. Um, so, and this goes on all the time. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's many others that likely do the same. It just hasn't come to light yet. Since Mega's launch in January, it now has more than 3 million registered users who have stored a total of 125 million files in the first month of operation. According to Kim.com, it took competitor Dropbox two years to achieve that. Why do you think Mega has had such a successful launch? Do you think it's because of Kim.com's massive free storage offering of 50 gigs? Or is there more that users are finding appealing about his philosophy on cloud storage? What's your opinion? Well, I think it's been a number of things. I think that there was a lot of curiosity when the service was first announced with much pomp and circumstance. Um, you know, th they gained quite a bit of notoriety uh, more, than, more than ever since all of this stuff happened, since, you know, the shutdown of the original Mega. Um, so, you know, a lot of people interested in, in what's going on and, and what this service is. And uh, I think that, that many people, however, I think the, the, what's really happening is a lot of people are concerned about the privacy of their files. But, you know, you're right. The, the storage offering is certainly something that's attracting people. The, the cloud storage philosophies, they, they have to help. I think that it's just... You know, it's a whole mix of things that are bringing people over to this mega, and these announcements are constant, and it seems like they're, they're quickly evolving and, you know, trying to, to find a user base, and, and they're finding it. 
Speaking in London on Tuesday, Francis Moore, the chief executive of the IFPI, which represents record labels internationally, said that the MoveAgainst.com's former file sharing service, Mega Upload, has had a positive effect, saying action by governments and courts have had a major impact and cloud locker services have seen a major reduction in traffic since the action against Kim.com. John, what's your reaction to Moore's statement? Do you believe the action taken against Kim.com has overall had a positive or a negative impact on the cloud community? Well, uh, clearly Moore has, has access to information that we don't. So, you know, we have to take that at face value and just kind of look at what he's saying and, and kind of talk about that. But, you know, I, I think that there was probably an attrition of some casual users for sure. Um, but there's been a lot of spreading into other services as well. I, I, I would have to estimate that the community is probably back on the upswing at this point. What, while, you know, whatever statistics he's looking at from whatever point of reference and, or period of time that he's referring to, we just don't know, really know what, that, what he's really talking about there. Um, so we have to take that with a grain of salt. In a contrasting move from Mega's secure email system, Apple is decreasing the privacy in their iCloud service in order to prohibit its use for activities they deem inappropriate. Their new measures include a system that audits emails for specific language and will interpret the email's transmission if the email includes language that Apple has declared unsavory. John, do you think this policy will have an effect on iCloud users? Well, I think absolutely. Anytime uh, privacy is lost, that, that's a tough thing for people to accept, um, especially when it comes to light in a very public way. Um, and some may find that unsettling. The question is, you know, why is Apple interrupting these email transmissions as, as you know, they, they catch these things coming out? You know, was it an attempt to prevent spam or are they actually censoring materials? Uh, it, it's hard to say. We've talked time and time again about how important it is that users read the terms of service. Technically, what Apple is doing is completely within their bounds, but at what point is it invasion of privacy to have a system which scans your emails and automatically emits content they find inappropriate, even though the messages could be completely legitimate? Well, I think that's a great question for the community to ask. Um, you know, what is acceptable? You know, what's the, the limit here? Do, do you want your messages filtered for content? I mean, if it's spam, that's one thing. The mechanisms are quite often very much the same. And I think that uh, when you when you think about your, your provider of email, um, you know, th how, do they re how do they address that as far as, you know, their official policy? And, you know, that's the thing that we're looking at is, you know, this, this whole question of, uh, you know what are what are the terms of service? Go through, read those things, and just figure out. You know, is there is there any type of uh, filtering that that you're not comfortable with? Do you think this is an honest attempt by Apple to remove spam from their system, or in trying to project an image, are they forcing users to stay clean or opt out of their service? What's your take? Well, you know that's that's the thing. Uh, you know, I. I th Personally, I think that uh, this is probably an attempt at blocking out spam, this particular incident that has brought this to light. But, you know, it raises a good question that Apple simply just hasn't answered yet. You know, do they aim to, to have some kind of uh, censorship or message control, or is this, you know, truly a spam tactic that was just happened to get caught in this particular incident? Thinking back to Instagram's terms of service issues that we've discussed on the show, consumers obviously want ownership over their content. We know that. Do you think companies like Apple will see consumer pushback due to this, especially with services like Mega offering the polar opposite, a completely private and encrypted email service? You know, uh, that's a great question, and it opens up it opens up the, the debate of whether Mega, you know, could it be used for spam and other types of email abuse? Um, you know, that's the other side of the of the coin there, um, freedom versus abuse. You know, Omega has traditionally run in a way that, you know, that they're not accountable, that they've sought out that pocket of legality and culpability, and, and they count on that gray area to operate. Um, you know, I, I think that in the end, um, I think that we'll see that Apple, you know, co comes out of this saying, hey, you know, we, we do some filtering, um, or, it, you know, it was just the spam incident. And, you know, the pushback, I mean, I think Apple's popularity and the, the amount of 
uh, abilities that people have to take email with them on the go and on their MacBooks and this and that. I think that they'll look uh, past this because most people, quite frankly, don't behave and you know have certain phrases that that would be caught, and most people would probably not even really notice. Well, John, it's definitely been a very interesting conversation this morning. Thanks so much for taking the time with us. Thank you. And your Social Angle Daily News Roundup is next here on SiliconANGLE TV. We looked at all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. There are plenty of tech shows that provide new gadgets and talk about the latest in gaming, but those shows are just the tip of the iceberg and we're here for the deep dive. There's a difference between technology consumers